Hey, hello everybody. We're going to go through some of my favorite parts from chapter five. Are you ready? I have simply titled this news criticisms. There are a lot of things to complain about the news about. So I'm going to show you some of my favorite things. Okay. Um, typically criticisms of the news include this list. If we were in a regular classroom, I would say, okay, which one of these criticisms irks you the most, if any? And typically people say, oh, lack of objectivity, the news is so biased. And my response is always, where does it say the news is supposed to be objective? Where were you promised objectivity in the news? Because news is a money-making business. So they're gonna tell us what we want to know and what we wanna hear rather than what we need to know and need to hear because they wanna keep us watching. So the idea that news is supposed to be objective, I think is naive. Um, we're naive to think that they are in it just to inform us. They are in it to make money. And I know that sounds kind of cynical, but it's, it's the nature of the beast. Okay. Uh, doctored photos usually surprises people. Doctored photos exist in advertising. We all acknowledge that and accept that readily. Doctored photos and news are a different animal. And I'll complain about that in just a few minutes. My biggest beef with the news is that there's a lack of context behind the stories. They show us really elaborate, um, affective, emotional, dramatic photos without much story behind it. Let's go through these in detail. You ready? Um, inaccuracies, of course, this is always a big problem. The, my favorite examples come from the coverage of Hurricane Katrina, that there were rapes in the Superdome, bodies stacked. Um, none of that happened. You know, sharks swimming down Bourbon Street. Social media does not help this because people share stories without verifying them themselves. Um, it's really easy to find mistakes in the news. Really easy. Like here's Prince Harry. He's not the Prince of Wales, W-A-L-E-S. His father is anyway, and that's spelled wrong. Um, clearly, Bin Laden is not running for the Senate in Rhode Island. That's not Hong Kong. <laughs> that's not Kansas. <laughs> um, None of these are countries. You know, um, to think that the news is like this almighty, omnipotent force that shares its information with us is really, um, really a problem. Remember, they have 24 hours of news to fill and, and they're managed by human beings. So there are going to be mistakes. There's going to be mistakes and sensationalism. Um, CNN labeled these countries incorrectly. That's clearly a problem. <laughs> um, another criticism that people have is the overemphasis on the visual. And remember back from week one, that actually relates to what medium you get your news from. So even though newspapers do tend to rely a lot on visuals now, much more than they used to, thanks to USA Today, um, if you get most of your news from television, obviously you're going to get primarily visual stories rather than literate stories. So let me show you how this has kind of evolved. Here's the Post-Dispatch the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Here's the Post-Dispatch the day after Kennedy's assassination. Here's the Post-Dispatch the day after Nixon resigns. Here's the Post after they found Sean Hornbeck. Um, so typically newspapers tend to really do photos on the front now. Um, and this is really interesting. This is a screenshot from CNN the night the, um, in November where the Ferguson grand jury um, non-verdict was released. So CNN and Fox both chose to do a half screenshot on the president. So here's the president talking about how he doesn't want violence, but on the other side of the screen, what do you see in violence? So Media scholars will tell you that if your ear hears one thing and your eye sees another, your eyes are going to overrule what you hear. So essentially what CNN is telling us here is that the president um, is ineffective. Here he is, you know, asking for peace. That's what we're hearing. But our eyes are telling us something different. And the visuals from the stories in Ferguson were visually compelling especially because most of the, um, the activity was at night.
Okay, that makes for a great video. And when I mean great, I mean great from a news production point of view because it makes for compelling video. Um, this is a picture that I took with my phone a few years ago. So the quality is lousy. But I had to take a picture of this front page of the Post-Dispatch because I thought it was so irresponsible. If you want to talk about, and Silverblatt writes about this in this chapter, when he talks about the gestalt or worldview of the news, take a look at this front page and really think to yourself, what is the Post-Dispatch telling the world about what it means to be a black person in St. Louis? You're either a rapper, if you look at the bottom, you're in poverty, if you look at the top photo, or you kill your children. Did no one notice? You're telling me that out of all the possible photos they could use for the poverty story, they would choose that one when it coupled with everything else on the front page that day? You have to think of the cumulative effect of these news messages and what they do to our worldview. And a lot of that ties into mean world syndrome, which Silverblatt talks about in chapter eight, the idea that when you consume a lot of news, your view of the world gets more negative. I bet we all have older relatives who don't like to go out at, at night because they might get carjacked. Yeah, mean world syndrome. Violent crime is actually down. Did you know that? Crime is down. Crime coverage. Up. Um, okay, so here's my big beef, the lack of context. Um, there's really not a lot of interest in international stories. and. There's a great, I, I always like to include this little story about when I asked an AP history teacher, I used to teach at an all girls high school and there was some flare ups in the Middle East as there tend to be, right? And I asked her, I said, can you explain this whole Arab Israel thing to me? And she went and got a chair and sat down. That should have been my first clue, right? She said, well, it goes back to Abraham. Yeah, that Abraham. I'm like, Old Testament Abraham? Yes. The idea that the news is supposed to teach us 2,000 or 3,000 years of history behind this story is ludicrous, right? We don't have the attention span for that. They don't have the time or the interest. But there is context here, and yet all we see, because we live in a visual society, we just see pictures like this and this and this. So we see pictures of problems in the Middle East, but no one in the American news media is telling us what the actual story is, where the conflict stems from. And it's kind of up to us to get that information, and that's work. It takes effort, right? Another classic criticism of the news is sensationalism, that it's just over the top, overly dramatic. And I know I showed you this in week one, but I think it's such a great example, like, woo, breaking news, Titanic sank 102 years ago. Um, this, I think, is a great example of trying to make a story out of nothing. And really, CNN, if there's one word that you can spell out and one word you can't, I'm pretty sure you just answered your own question, right? A lot of times when I'm watching the news, I think, why is this news? And I'm like, oh, well, they have 24 hours to fill. Sometimes I tend to think that we would be better informed with just 10 minutes of news instead of 24 hours. It was a big story a couple months ago that Hillary Clinton went to Chipotle. Of course, she's got to eat. She's a person. Oh, and I showed you this in week one. Yeah, it's just silly. So then we get to the lack of objectivity criticism. Uh, I always kind of chuckle to myself when someone says, well, Fox is so biased. I'm like, well, yeah, and so is MSNBC, and so is CNN, and so is ABC, and so is CBS. It's like, don't just pick on Fox. Everybody's biased. If there's a human telling you a story, it's virtually impossible for that human to not let some of their viewpoints through. I mean, I'm not objective when people come to me and say, hey, what do you think I had a major in? What do you think I try to talk him into? Because I'm not objective, right? Okay, so what you need to know is that typically um, media companies tend to donate much more money to um, the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. So does that filter down into coverage? Um, my response is, how can it not? 
How can it not? So we have photos like this. Okay. Saintly photos. Uh, evil photos. I know I showed you this one already. Um, this photo was taken of Hillary. Many people claim that it's it's what lost her the 2008 primary. Um, both of these photos were actually on the same page, same front page of the New York Times on the same day. And I think, of course, you know, we have President Obama with the um, with the halo. But I think it's this picture with Paul Ryan is just so weird the way that it's cropped and the red. I've had students before say it looks like he's in hell. Like, I know. So we have Paul Ryan in hell and um, St. Obama on the same front page of the New York Times. So even if you don't read English, even if you don't read the paper, you still kind of get an idea about the leanings of the paper just by looking at the images. This is visual literacy, visual communication. Um, there's inherent racism in a lot of news photos like this one. Um, these were actually just a day or two apart. The white kids were arrested and the pictures they show were probably either from the wrestling team website or the fraternity composite photo. But the black people that were arrested, they show their mugshots. So it's interesting to see how much they can communicate just with the images, right? This. Um, you know, the, the Michael Brown coverage gave me so many examples to use in class. These were the um, breaking news tweets from Fox and CNN when Michael Brown's um, assailant was not indicted. Look at the words, word choice. Just pause this for a second and read these. What's really interesting about the Michael Brown story is that he was 18, right? He was 18. So according to the Associated Press style book, he is, should be referred to as a man in all news stories. He's a man. But CNN chooses to describe him as unarmed black teen, which is very sympathetic, right? So CNN, whoever wrote that, is like breaking the rules from the Associated Press style book, which is the basic Bible for reporters. It's very interesting how just the word choice, I mean, they're telling us the same story, but they're presenting it to us in two different ways with two different vibes. So I, I really think these kind of examples are fascinating, fascinating. This showed up on my Facebook feed and this made me unhinged. Uh, this man's not a sexual predator. They just used his picture for this ad. It's not an attractive picture of the man. Clearly, he's angry. But are we perpetuating the stereotype? Like, oh, we need to be scared of black men. See how this works? Really, my, my goal for any media literacy class is that when you're done, you can't stop noticing stuff like this. I want it to make you crazy like it makes me. <laughs> oh, this is fun. These are old, but oh, they're so good. Look at the headlines. Same story. Essentially, the same thing happened. An officer that was in the motorcade was killed in an accident. But Time said that the Bush motorcade killed the cop. And the, um, the officer that was killed escorting Hillary Clinton was just killed. So it's a passive voice. But Bush was a killer. Essentially, the same story. Different people, different year presented to us in different ways. Um, we talked a little bit about Us Magazine week one, but it's very obvious here where their leanings lie, right? Look at the connotative words on the cover for the left. Lies and scandal. You gotta love it. These uh, issues actually appeared one week apart. Classic, classic. Um, biggest word on the left, wimp. And on the right, they're asking why anybody who, basically saying anybody who criticizes the president is dumb. So it's very, um, gosh, I was going to say it's subtle. It's not subtle in this case at all. So can we believe what we see in the news? Um, is this the best Photoshop you've ever seen? I know. I love it. 
No, I think that you need to have your internal bullshit detector on with news photos as well because they get doctored. Is it acceptable to doctor news photos? I say no, um, but I'm like a lone voice in the wilderness. I say no because they need to present truth to us, right? Isn't that kind of an understood thing? They give us the truth. But in many cases, these photos get doctored. This was a picture that was on, um, appeared on the front page of the Los Angeles Times. And granted, it's old, but it's such a good example. Actually, that, that photo was a composite of these two. So I think it's really interesting. Why not just use one of these? Like if, if any of you were a photography major and would like to tell me why either one of these wasn't appropriate, please let me know because I, I think it's really interesting. This is such a compelling photo. We've got the gun and the hand and the man with the kid. Maybe, maybe the editor didn't think that either one of these was compelling, but the photographer was actually fired after this because he did um, doctor, the, doctor the photo that was on the front page. Here's a front page of Dr. Condoleezza Rice, who was Secretary of State at the time. She, this appeared on the front of the Los Angeles Times as well. If you notice, her eyes are exceptionally creepy. This is the original photo. So um, when, no, actually this was the USA Today, sorry. When the USA Today was called out about this, they're like, oh, we were just trying to get some dust specks out of her eyes. I'm like, she looks like a reptile. Um, a lot of photos from the Middle East have some props inserted in them to try to generate sympathy. So we've got Mickey, we've got a teddy bear, and look at Minnie Mouse, like perfectly clean, totally staged right there in that photo. So when you see it, you're supposed to think, oh my God, kids live there, it's terrible, I feel bad for whoever lives there, and I hate whoever shot, whoever dropped that bomb. This was a photo that appeared last year during the Syrian refugee crisis. And when you see it, your brain says that this little boy is sleeping in between the grave of who? His parents, right? It's like your, your brain fills in what it doesn't know. But it's not true. It was actually staged by the photographer. The kid was traveling with his parents and didn't know who was buried there. But this is a compelling photo, isn't it? You see it and your heart breaks. It's staged. Internal bullshit detectors. Activate them. Uh, oh, let's talk about George Zimmerman and Trayvon. If you want to show him in a favorable light, which picture do you use? If you want to make him look like a bad guy, you use the other picture. Same with Trayvon. Same with Michael Brown. Um, here's Mussolini, but here's the original. See, so here he looks all like strong and brave, and here he looks like he's kind of at a kid's birthday party, <laughs> right? So we just airbrush that out. So the the doctoring of photos has been around forever. And I talked about this in week one, how you can crop a photo to make it look a certain way. Um, this was a big story on Twitter last year during the Syrian refugee crisis. They found Marwan wandering alone. No, he wasn't alone. He was with this enormous group of people. Okay, so our polls news. I hate polls. I hate polls. You know, I'm going to skip over this part a little bit, but I want you to take a look at some of the ways that poll questions are written. This question was uh, from 1994, and it's one of my favorite examples because it's asking the same thing. But I want you to do is pause the video right now and read these polling questions and tell me how people would typically answer to each one. Okay, so clearly, most people responded yes to the top. You ask the same people the question on the bottom and they say no. It's the same question, but it all depends on how the words are used. Because there are some connotative words in that bottom question. Deployed, women, overseas, to fight. Okay, so you want to write that question if you want people to say no. Uh, here's a great polling question from last year. Okay, now the thing that I hate about polls, well, there's several things I hate about polls. The results can be manipulated by who you ask and how you write the question, but also news organizations tend to treat polls as news. And I think that that's a disservice because it doesn't actually talk about any issues. It leads news organizations to talk about um, elections as a horse race rather than anything of relevance. So. The story is usually who's ahead, who's behind, and what the strategies are, rather than what they actually think about certain issues. So we get, um, oh my gosh, this one showed up online during the last election. Who would you rather have over for dinner? You know, 
the person that I'd rather have over for dinner might not necessarily be the person I want in the Oval Office. It's a, it's a ridiculous, silly question. But people report this as news. Um, this is not news. Because it all depends on who you ask and how you phrase the question. It's crazy. But like I said, they have 24 hours of news they got to fill every day. So what I want you to do is really start to pay attention. Absolutely get your news from as many sources as possible. If you get your news from only one source, you're engaging in something called selective exposure, where you, you're only going to end up in an echo chamber, where you only hear things that affirm beliefs that you already hold dear. You want to try to get your news from as many different sources as possible, as many different points of view as possible, to make yourself well-rounded, and it'll help you defend the positions that you already have. So um, it would make me super happy if you all found examples and shared them with the class on the discussion board, because this kind of stuff, it gets me really excited. And yes, I'm a nerd. Okay, that is... Um, the bias and news criticism lecture for week five. See everybody.